Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. I'm your host, Lisa, and I'm here today with my co-host, Van Cat. We're trying something a little bit new this season. Um, we're gonna start off with a short show and tell. Van Cat, I think you had something you wanted to show and tell today. Yeah, so since we are on episode two, that's B, uh, I wanted to show this thing called a Barlow lens. So um, a Barlow lens is basically a way to increase the magnification on a telescope. So in a regular telescope, like the simplest kind of telescope, you have two lenses, right? You have the, what's called the objective and what's called the eyepiece. And the magnification of a telescope is you divide the focal length of the objective by the focal length of the eyepiece. So if it's like a thousand millimeter um, uh, objective and like a 10 millimeter uh, eyepiece, you get a magnification of a hundred, right? Mm -hmm. So a Barlow lens is basically a convex lens. This is a Barlow lens that you can shove in the eyepiece end and it's sort of, it's a, sorry, it's a, it's a concave lens, not a convex. It's a double concave lens. And what it does is it extends the focal length of the objective. And this is supposed to be a 2X Barlow lens. And since we have a camera, I can try and show what it looks like. Let's see. There. So that's what a Barlow lens is. Closer or farther away in the photo? You should see me slightly smaller since it's a concave lens. Okay. Right? So, yeah, I do see slightly smaller. This is correct. Okay, so the reason I think this is interesting is normally we think of like, you know, uh, fashion and tastes as uh, things about clothes, right? Like clothes, shoes, you might say that's tacky and that's um, premium or whatever, but it struck me that a Barlow lens is an example of a premium mediocre lens because it extends magnification without actually extending resolution. So when you're getting into astronomy, it's sort of a cheap way to get more uh, magnification, but it doesn't really improve the view that much. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't, but it's like the CSI kind of thing where it's like you have a surveillance photograph and somebody says magnify and enhance and somehow magically everything gets magnified and enhanced. So Barlow lens is sort of something you buy if you want to do that kind of stunt. In this case, there's actually a use. It's uh, useful for taking photographs, but yeah. A Barlow lens is a premium mediocre telescope lens. So that's my show and tell object for today. Okay, cool. Um, so my well, show have. and tell object for today, yeah, um, kind of goes with the theme of what we're supposed to be talking about, the greater theme of this episode, um, which is Bitcoin. So I've, got, I've actually got a couple of um, hardware wallets here with me. I have a T1 Treasure, this Trezor, this was their mm -hmm. like first, this was my first hardware wallet. I bought it, I want to say in 2017, summer oh, that's 2017. Pretty late. Uh, I think, I don't think, I think they had already like kickstarted. I don't know if they were a kickstarter or what. Um, but uh, I also have, I have like the, whatever the T2 model is. Oh, okay. Uh, I have, let me see if I have it right here. You can show the two brands that exist. It's also a nano. Ledger? Ledger. Oh, yeah. Ledger. You've got I the have ledger. A, yeah, yeah, I have a ledger. I have some downstairs. I don't actually know where they are. Um, you so have... these actually <laughs> You have to plug them in to get them. So you have them. multiple, huh? I also have a cold card. And do all of them contain millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin? Yes, I am so wealthy in Bitcoin. All of them are, no, I don't know. I have no idea. I actually just moved a bunch of money around, so I don't actually know where it is. It's on one of these somewhere. Um, but uh, the, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, oh yeah, so cold card is cool because you have to use little chips to get it onto the computer. Um, whereas the other ones you plug in with a wire. So they're wired. And then the Nano, I don't know if you've got the Nano version. The Nano version that I was looking at that looks really cool um, has Bluetooth, so it'll actually work with your phone. So like the iOS. Yep. IOS That's the newer one. one. I think the one I have is older and it doesn't do Bluetooth. It's, um, yeah, fully aired. Yeah, now. but there's a newer version that'll do Bluetooth. So for those of you who aren't super familiar with Bitcoin and or maybe you know a bit about Bitcoin but aren't familiar with the hardware wallet uh, idea, um, with Bitcoin, so Bitcoin is kind of cool because you <laughs> you basically lock money to um, private keys, and then in order to unlock it, you have to know the private key to produce a signature that allows you to relock it to a different private key. Um, the 
way that you store, like, you, so then you have this question of where do you store all your private keys? Um, in the old days, you just had them all in software, which meant they existed on your computers. If your computer, which is connected to the internet, ever got hacked or destroyed, or your hard drive burned down, or you know, you're just failed, stuff happens um, on your main computer, for example, then all of your private keys would basically disappear. I mean, there's some ways you can back them up and stuff, but or but basically I think the idea is you keep it off of your computer so that no one can hack into your computer and get access to where all your private keys are and steal all your Bitcoin. Um, so people invented these little devices, called hardware wallets, that keep all the private key information on it. Um, and then anytime you wanna sign a transaction, you have to send the transaction to the device, which is why I was holding up the different forms of how you get it to the device. Like, so this one's got, you know, the, oh, it doesn't actually, oh, okay. So then it'll be like, here's a new Bitcoin address. Is this an okay address to like send things to? I don't know if you can see that. Yep, so anybody wants to send Let's Lisa see. money, you oh. can do that. <laughs> Yeah, if you wanted to send Lisa money, um, it's not, I, don't, I guess that's really hard to yeah, see. Yeah, it's, it's too low resolution to see, but yeah. Have you seen people do that at like um, ball games and stuff? They'll hold up like a big sign with their uh, Bitcoin um, address QR code. You have not seen this? People do no. that. Yeah, and people actually send them money. I've seen like several examples of this, but yeah. At a football game, just hold up a huge poster with a QR code. And if it's high enough resolution, yeah, you can just send them money. I've seen that a couple of times. Why would anyone send you money, though, is the part that I don't understand. Just because you have it up and they like it? Yeah, why not? <laughs> I mean, uh, I think a lot of the initial transactions for a lot of cryptocurrencies are just people having fun sending uh, it to each other. Like, uh, I remember this happened with uh, a bunch of us who signed on for the initial genesis thing of uh, you know, what's the stellar the stellar that eventually became stellar lumens the mm -hmm. uh, stripe currency and when we got it it was like all right this is like just a joke currency and all we were doing was like sending a bit to each other later on it actually became worth something so it's a key base it's a key base currency right i think uh, yeah it, it, it's not a true cryptocurrency it's uh, it has a central database kind of thing like uh, oh, that. okay like what's the other one ripple ripple is also like that so ripple and stellar aren't true blockchain based cryptocurrencies but uh, yeah so i think people initially just have fun with transactions then they realize it's worth money and then hey transactions is the last thing you do yeah i actually so bitcoin thing so i actually somehow ended up down a rabbit hole this morning looking at something called cassius coins which were a very early physical currency version of Bitcoin. Um, some guy, I wanna say in like Wyoming, um, was printing out holograms with Bitcoins on them. Like he'd put like a private key. So we we're talking mm -hmm. about hardware wallets. Oh, this is actually a good example of another way you can store a private key. Print it out on a hologram, slap the hologram onto a minted coin. So he like found a place that made car wash tokens and had them print out like Bitcoin, like said one Bitcoin and then got a bunch of holograms and stuck them on the coins. Um, and he sent, he was, so it had a private key, but he would send one Bitcoin to the um, public, to the public key version of it. So if you had the coin, you take the hologram off and type it into like a wallet or whatever. And um, then you could get the, you could spend the coin. It's kind of weird though, because um, like, that actually confused me when I first started uh, looking into crypto stuff where you think the metaphor of a coin actually works, but it doesn't since the key is an address. And if you have a physical coin with like a key on it and you send half of it, that coin is now, even though it's physically the same, that address now represents half the money, right? So yeah. that's, that's a problem with uh, using the key metaphor directly with um, like a hardware. So it, so the coin is analogous to a wallet rather than a coin, which is why the stock photography of like little gold Bitcoins are like kind of pointless because each of the coins is literally a wallet rather than a coin. Right? Uh, yeah, it's true because if you knew what the public key for that key is, you could send more to it. So it would be more than a Bitcoin. Exactly, exactly. Depending on how much you've been locked to the public key that the private key was on the coin too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that's the thing with all those physical stuff, right? Is at some point someone printed out the private key and stuck it on a Bitcoin. 
do you trust the human that printed out the thing and stuck it on the coin? So maybe the hologram isn't like messed with, but maybe there's a backup copy of all those. Yeah. Maybe keep somewhere. Like this is kind of a problem with I feel like any physical representation of Bitcoin. Um, actually, like so the guys who made the cold card wallet. That's um, maybe it's one guy. I don't know. The cold card was this one. They also do something called Open Dime, which is a an attempt to recreate the like um, the whole coin, physical coin thing. Okay. You could put a value on the thing, but it's like verifiable, so you can verify how much money it is when you get it. Cause it's like a little USB stick, um, and so you could plug it in and verify that it's got that much money on it um, before you accept them or something. Um, I don't exactly remember exactly how they work, but the whole idea is that you could have a whole bunch of physical Bitcoin so you could trade it in person without having to actually make a transaction and send it. Um, uh, I guess the only way you could get a truly indivisible coin is to go to the lowest unit. So one Satoshi, since you can't divide it further, but even then it's, you're not really like transferring the whole thing as a unit. You're sending it from one address to the other. So if you had like a, an address printed on a physical coin that was one Satoshi worth, you, you'd have to send it all, but then it would be in a new coin. It wouldn't be the old coin, right? So Yeah, yeah. and you can't really even send a Satoshi because there's a, there's a smallest amount of-, of Oh, of transaction coin. fees, yep. Yeah, this is called the dust limit. Um, most every output transaction has to be at least as big as the dust limit. Oh, okay, and is that a function of uh, the transaction fees? Is that why there's a dust limit? I believe so. Yes. Um, I can't remember. I think it's like, so I think that the dust limit, the current dust limit is 543 Satoshis. Um, and I think that, I believe that it is 3x the total amount of Satoshis you would mean need for a, so like they take like the smallest transaction you could make, which is like one signature, one input, one output, and there's one signature that's required to, um, Spend it like to verify that you mm -hmm. didn't spend the coins, move the coins, um, and they so they take the whole like total number of bytes of that required times one for one satoshi. So that's the fee that you would spend, and then multiply it by three. So if I get, hang on, if I divide 543, I like I looked this up a while ago. 543 divided by three, you get 181. So it's I think 181 is the smallest technical like fee that you could spend, but the dust rate was like three x that for reasons. Okay. That kind of makes sense. Uh, hmm. I, I did not know that. I was not aware of the dust rate concept. So, hey, I learned something new today. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, you've been working on your own wallet sort of uh, software and you're writing a book about how to make your own wallet, right? So tell us about that. Yeah, so this is my <laughs> super secret book project that I haven't really talked about anywhere, but I can talk about it today. Maybe this will make me actually spend more time working on it. Um, I'm working on a book about that's specifically on like uh, the Bitcoin transaction protocol. So it won't talk at all about blocks or a network or really about getting your transaction mined, except as it relates to maybe some of the fee rate stuff, but that tends to get kind of complicated. Um, anyways, yeah, but it's basically a primer and the idea is that anyone who's like fairly tech savvy, but doesn't know much about Bitcoin or Bitcoin transactions could go through the book and like the exercise and examples. And by the end of it, have a very good idea of what code you would need to write to write your own working Bitcoin wallet. So it, um, is it just covers like basically everything you need to know about like a Bitcoin wallet software. So why would anybody want to write their own Bitcoin wallet? I mean, I don't make my own paper wallet, so. You wouldn't, but it's, sometimes it's nice to know what all the, I mean, it's kind of more, it's also a documentation, I think, of a lot of the stuff that currently goes into like the requirements. So the way that like the Bitcoin, so I work on, I work on a Bitcoin project called the Lightning Network. Mm -hmm. um, which has a whole spec writing process. And anytime that um, new rules about what's allowed and what isn't are added to how lightning nodes communicate and talk to each other, um, it has to be added to the spec and there's like a formal spec review process. And there's a bunch of different organizations that each have their own implementation of the lightning specification. And so interoperation between all the different variations of lightning nodes is like something that we spend a lot of time working on and like, have a formal working process for making sure that everyone can understand each other on the same network. Bitcoin started in a really different way. 
And the way that Bitcoin started was with a single person writing a code base based off of a white paper that they had produced. Um, mm -hmm. And then the code base became, to a large extent, the documentation of like very early Bitcoin stuff. Since then, they have a they have a process, it's like kind of a specification process for updating Bitcoin. But a lot of like a lot of the updates require previous knowledge of all the other of how Bitcoin kind of currently works. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that by writing this book, it sort of is like a good introduction to like the base layer. So you could read the book and then you could go and look at pretty much any Bitcoin spec proposal. They're called BIPs, which is like Bitcoin improvement proposal. Um, I was, yeah. Um, but the whole idea is that like basically this book is like really ground, good grounding and like the, here's like all the basic functionality and how these different things work. And like, it's a good compendium and like guide or like resource for things that you might encounter as you're trying to understand the BIPs. And so like a lot of the book process really is like taking a BIP and writing it in other words that are like more easy to understand and like with very simple examples. Um, and like I have so, a bunch um, of- So it's, it's almost much. like, uh, this is like, you're, you're writing a book about something that looks more like a process of getting a driver's license and the purpose of uh, the software is to learn the bureaucracy around getting that software uh, approved, right? Yeah, it's uh, a technical guy. It's like, I mean, it's kind of like, not rest, I mean, it's kind of like recipes, like the, none of the code is like super long or anything. They're like little snippets and you can like pull them out and try them yourself. Um, would you call like uh, uh, a simple wallet, the hello world program of um, the Bitcoin ecosystem? Is that the simplest kind of like non-trivial Bitcoin program you could write? Like, is that where you would, a beginner would start learning Bitcoin programming? I think it's a good place to start learning because the transaction sits at the, like, I think there's, there's like a lot of other stuff you get into on the edges around like block composition and mining and network relay and um, mempool stuff, which I don't even talk about. I don't spend any time talking about Bitcoin scripts, except the little bit that you need to know. Like, there's some like very formulaic and almost like, there's like standardized scripts that almost every Bitcoin transaction uses. And so like we cover, that's basically like what we cover the very basics of them, but like we don't go into like all the fancy cool things that you can do with scripts. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, so like there's a lot of stuff that I've like basically, I feel like cut out or put to the side. I was like, no, this isn't in, this isn't in scope of this because like this is just like how do transactions work. So uh, what's the sort of um, basic necessary conditions? Like what language is this written in? How does it compile? Like, is it a C program? Is it embedded somewhere? Like uh, what's the, 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 yeah, the example wallet that you're teaching people to write? I mean, all my examples are in Python. And it's oh, like- it can be written in Python, okay. Pulled apart into pieces and stuff that you, it's not, you would have to do some glue work sticking all the parts together, but I think that's by intention. Like, it's not, I don't really want you to like, I mean, you could probably, I don't, hmm, I'm not sure I would recommend writing your own Bitcoin wallet, but um, at least after reading this book, you might be able to audit whatever Bitcoin wallet software you're using, which I feel like is a good goal. Um, Though there's a reason I asked that question because I keep thinking of uh, people who have all those speculative scenarios for wallets. Like we think of wallets as a, a human artifact. Like everybody carries one around with some money and cards in it. But when you talk to people who want to do like weird edgy applications of Bitcoin, they talk of things like cars that uh, have their own little wallets and can rent themselves to you and accept payments and at the low end of um, smallest, this is no longer kind of feasible with Bitcoin because it's gotten so valuable. But I remember early days, people were talking about things like you could implement a non-neutral um, network using Bitcoin by having like routers um, that are handling the TCP IP stack. They would look at packet by packet priority and a packet that wanted to go the next hop on the fast lane it would just pay extra, right? So every packet would have like um, an address for like basically an easy pass, right? And that works if the value of um, Bitcoin or whatever currency is low enough where it's like micro pennies or something. But yeah, nobody's going to pay a dollar a packet to get extra hops right now at least. But that, that's what I was thinking of. Like there are weird things I think that fit the idea of a wallet that we are not used to. 
Yeah, I think that's true. And I think I spend a lot of time in the book talking about what is a wallet, what's in a wallet, how is a wallet, a Bitcoin wallet different than like a wallet with money in it or a wallet with a check in it, right? Because like, you know, actually, and so, okay, now I get to talk about the book that I'm really excited about that yes. I just started reading. Um, it's called Electronic Value Exchange. Um, have you heard of this book before? No, I haven't. Okay, so it is a amazing, like, it's definitely written in an academic bent. Um, it's part of like, anyways, but it's an amazing kind of history of computing look at the origins of the Visa electronic payment system. Um, okay. Yeah, it, so it like goes through the like establishment of this like it, Visa is like kind of a well, debatable. Yeah, it's a pre-Bitcoin, and it's like kind of decentralized. Like it wasn't exactly decentralized, but there was a lot of convincing a lot of people who don't, you know, like different banks around the country. Ha it was in their interest to be able to accept and route payments through other banks. Um, but kind of organizing all of them together and developing like a common protocol that they would all accept and like understand was like a whole process. So it's been mm -hmm. really interesting reading the predecessor of how money moved kind of between all these different entities. It was a lot of like non, like a lot of it early, at least like I've, I've only got through the first couple of chapters so far, but like before, um, before like Visa was created and they had like centralized clearing houses, a lot of like credit card, so there's actually like two, anyways, there's, uh, where, how, I don't know how, many, how far do I want to go down on this rabbit hole? Um, the, uh, we but have, like the whole I thing think, about uh, Visa. 10 minutes, like, so you can go down about 10 minutes worth of money trail, I think. Okay, so like, so there's several iterations of digital, what I would call digital payments in the United States. So, so this is actually, and like the founder of Visa is actually credited to a large part was like creating this revolution of, he was like super obsessed with like how money had changed from being like actual physical goods and to being an entity that anyone who could store and transmit um, electronic data could become a money transmitter. And so his whole, he was like one of the first people to really understand this. And so his whole thing with Visa was kind of like, we're gonna kind of pulling away from this like concept of like a credit card had to represent like a credit account, but it could be backed by an investment checking account or it could be a debit card. Um, and sort of just like this abstraction of what money was from um, like gold and silver or paper dollars or checks. Um, so it was like anyway, fiat credit actual, that was not backed by anything, right? I mean, it, it, like well, today we think of it as unsecured some credit. Value somewhere else, but value was mostly numbers in a database somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so any number in any database that was like um, accepted by other, the other people understood its value would be, you could transact using like the visa system and it could like pass through the visa clearing system. Um, but like, so early credit cards before visa network got created and there was, there was like the competing master charge, which then became MasterCard network. Um, I think it was the interbank. So there were like a couple competing networks at the same time. And you could kind of decide who you wanted to sign up with to like process stuff with, but a lot of, um, so like checks used to, so the way that checks used to be processed had to do with like, you would actually have to send the physical paper check to the institution that had your account, right? Mm -hmm. So you'd give a check to a merchant and then it had to like basically make its way all the way back to the organization that um, it belonged to. Um, and back in the days, so the Fed eventually came into this or this like um, place and like opened up like the Fed Clearinghouse. Um, and the way that the Fed Clearinghouse works is that every member bank of the Fed like Clearinghouse would send physical money deposit to the Fed so that there was like a, an account balance on the yeah. Fed's balance sheet. And so anytime you needed to move money between the accounts, it was just at a ledger entry because the money didn't have to move it. It already like moved ahead of time, um, which I thought was really fascinating. It's like, wow. So like the Fed created a clearinghouse for checks. And so any bank that like had a relationship with the federal bank, which most of them did at some level was like a subsidiary of a bank that eventually had a Fed thing. It was easy to send the checks to a central clearinghouse and the balances would all just magically get shuffled to the right place. And then like, you're done. You don't actually have to send paper checks all around anywhere. Um, anyways, so like when credit cards came on the scene, they, um, 
they had like basically it was like a sales receipt right and it was like i so and so whatever here's my card number here's like the authorization number that i called the bank from um here's how much i spent on whatever day at what place whatever um that gets all written down as a receipt kind of thing and then that becomes like the basically like the check version right and you send it to that has to make it all the way to the bank where the person has the account and then they put it on the person's account and they get paid, they, you know, you send it to the customer, they pay you and then the money flows all the way back. So at some point before Visa existed, um, they were like, okay, can we just like send, so like every bank, you know, every merchant had a bank that they would go take their, you know, hey, Joe bought $50 this from us and Sally bought $20 of that and we've got all these like credit card receipts and you would take it to your bank that processed payments for you and your bank would like pretty much immediately put money in your account in exchange for these like receipts. Mm -hmm. um, and then you as a bank would have to go and figure out what bank had the card money from and go figure out how to exchange it with them to get the money that they owed you, but that you had paid to the merchant customer, right? Uh, and at some point they were like, and so the way that early Visa was actually run by Bank of America, but the early way that they um, did this was like super ad hoc and it was like a huge mess and you had to like call up all the different people or send it wherever. And like, it would, they would, it would take forever for them to like move to the right place. Um, and anyways, so at some point they were like, Hey, like fed, you're doing this for checks already. Can we just send you all these credit card things and you can just like do the same thing and figure it out and it'll like be fine. And the fed was like, no, we handle checks. We don't handle like these credit ledger things with customers. Um, so that actually, so the Fed actually refusing to process or handle like the central, to, to be the central clearinghouse for credit card transactions created like a basically negative space for an organization such as Visa to show up in and um, provide the clearinghouse and the centralization of all the payment processing in the same place. Um, it's actually interesting because like, both, like what is payment processing, right? Payment processing is just the process of like, moving the money from one person's account to the other right except yep. the accounts are so distributed in so many different little places that don't talk to each other it's like how do we get all these different things to talk to each other um it's like why don't you have that with bitcoin well bitcoin solved this problem by there only being a single ledger so an update in the ledger was global and so like all the state is kept in one place and you don't have to worry about sending messages between five million people to update the state because it doesn't I think an interesting, so th this is a development that seems to rhyme throughout financial history. Like now mm -hmm. I'm thinking about like uh, uh, even pre-Fed. So the Fed was created in like 1913 or something to do this. So there was like the early bank that, the, that was created in the 1780s and then Andrew Jackson shut it down, the National Bank, I think it was. And then the modern Fed emerged in 1913. Uh, but for a long period, the way credit worked in the US was any bank could issue currency. So there was like a currency system, but since most people didn't, so I don't know if you've seen this, like there's a, a forgotten town called Singapore in Eastern Michigan or Western Michigan that was like buried under the sand. And there's a bank of Singapore there that's forgotten and dead now that issued its own currency. And there was like a period in the mid 19th century when there were hundreds of currencies, every bank was issuing its own, but the actual, but most of it was worthless, but the actual real money was since a lot of America was farmers, they had uh, they were selling futures contracts on agricultural produce over to Europe. And so basically the thing you had showing that you were wealthy was, I have a harvest I'm expecting in six months and I have this futures contract for this guaranteed sort of purchase price. And that effectively was the um, currency instrument. So I, I think of that as uh, like, every futures contract itself being a bank. So you could go to somebody else and say, hey, I want to buy some equipment and here's a letter of credit, you can keep it. This is worth this much, right? So it's like uh, a currency unit that's equal to just one futures contract and reconciling it is just resolving that one transaction with whoever owned the other end of the future contract in London or something. So there's that. Then you had the currency versions, I think the same process like what you're describing Visa going through even basic dollar currency went through that. Like uh, there was the gold standard, then in between there was the Bretton Woods standard where it was gold, but it was really the US dollar and it was still the gold because the US was the only country that had like enough gold to back its own dollar. So everybody else converted to the US dollar and the US dollar was pegged to gold. 
And then when you got off the Bretton Woods system in the 1970s, eventually it became this sort of free floating thing of everybody just claiming what their value is and you have bonds, right? So you, I, I think you have this, uh, I don't know, repeating history of starting out centralized and then an instrument becomes decentralized and then you have a reconciliation process. And in a way it feels like Bitcoin and crypto people are rediscovering a lot of things within a new medium. And sometimes they discover new things that the previous media didn't have, like, you know, cryptographic signatures and private keys and stuff. But other times it's like you've, you're solving a problem that was solved a hundred years ago and you're starting to make the mistakes they made in 1885, right? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's totally yeah. fair. Uh, um, uh, so this is uh, about the visa book. Uh, so, so this is about the birth of the visa system? Or this the book? Visa? Okay. Yeah. 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 It's about the, uh, yeah, it's exactly about the ur origins of the visa payment system. It's fascinating. Um, and are you getting some good ideas from it to use in your lightning network programming? Nothing has like hit me exactly, but it's like really interesting to read in context of like having worked at square cash and like having worked on payment systems and like credit card processing stuff like it always felt really like so i worked i'm realizing now that i actually have quite the history of working in payment systems uh -huh. um i worked for a very small amount of time never actually joined the payments team at etsy but worked really closely with them on one of their projects when i was there as like an android developer and it was kind of this like so etsy runs their own card processor they basically uh -huh. wrote all the code that stripe has so oh wow okay like, yeah, Etsy has its own version of Stripe embedded in the Etsy code base. Um, they follow all the PCI compliance stuff. Their our app is architected in such a way that it only influences because there's like regulations about how code can be deployed, who can deploy the code versus who writes it when it's dealing with like credit card information. And like um, they've written like the way that all that stuff is like very siloed from the rest of the code so that only certain people can touch the payment code so that it, the whole app like so is that because it's of, big enough and there's enough transaction be. volume that you it's worthwhile not paying the margin to the merchant processor is that why you would write your own payment uh, processing it's etsy etsy rolled everything themselves that was just the thing it was a diy company like it was a it was a maker like we was a craft we were like craft people we handle i'm all just surprised stuff. because it's um, it's it seems too I small to it. do it because amazon does it but amazon is so huge and processes yeah, so much Stripe did not exist when Etsy got started. Oh, yeah. That's true. Like, uh, you you know, if you were going to accept, I mean, I think they integrated with PayPal, but at some point they also did the integration themselves yeah. and weren't just dependent on PayPal um, to accept stuff. So, yeah, yeah Stripe really, and Braintree like, came like, as, so like, uh, I, mm -hmm. yeah, Stripe and Braintree emerged around the same time as the second generation payment processors, like 2010, 2013, somewhere in that period, right? Yeah, and Etsy's older. Like 27, 2007, 2008. Okay. So like they were around for a while. Yeah. Anyways, um, but like even working at Etsy, like so I worked at like a payment processor company actually, which now I realize is really rare for anyone who works at like a, you know most people who work at web companies don't actually work at payment processor companies. Um, but uh, anyways, like the weird thing about the thing about working there that I didn't really ever understand is like, okay, but where does this card data go? Like there was a, there was like another layer behind us that we interfaced with that I was like, okay, but like how many deep, how many layers deep is this? Like we're the card processor, but we seem to be seeming sending all of our data like to this other company or something. I don't really understand what's going on here. I mean, I wasn't writing that code. I was like doing different layer of stuff on the mobile end of it. But, um, yeah, it seemed really like, it was like, okay, there's like a lot of question marks here about exactly how many layers down do you go before you get to whatever is a credit card payment. So um, you've been digging deeper and deeper since then. So at Etsy, you were there, then you were at Square. How long were you at Square? I was only at Square for like five months and I worked on the Bitcoin team there. So I was, I, other than like things I picked up from like orientation and just kind of like talking to people about stuff, um, I didn't really have a lot of hands-on experience on any of the card processing stuff that happens at Square. Um, but um, this book, this electronic value exchange, it seems like it's gonna explain all the things I've ever wanted to know and I'm really excited about it. Um, so yeah. after you read this and after you're done with whatever you're building for your 
you know, book wallet as well as your job, you will know enough to kind of like know the entire sort of um, transaction processing stack yeah. Yeah. from both the traditional end of like dollars and credit cards to the other extreme of crypto. And then yeah. you will invent a currency for us uh, so people can pay us money with Scorpio coins or something. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the logical next step. We're that's something that's never quite taken off, right? Like uh, back when Ethereum was taking off, everybody wanted to have their own ERC-20 token currency and a bunch of people kind of did. There's a bunch of little startups, um, but it's, I, I haven't seen that idea take off. There's like a couple of small startups doing like everybody roll your own currency, but why isn't that thing taking off? I mean, so I would say like, I think like distribution mechanism is a big thing. And they actually like talk about this in the credit card thing. Like when they were just trying to get credit cards to like become a thing, they would literally go to like a town in like Fresno, California and just mail hundred thousand people a credit card. Um, and then just hope that you start taking it to the thing and start using it. So like that is eventually they made that illegal in like 1971, like they passed a the law that you're no longer allowed to do that. Um, so that like growth hacking was only legal for a little bit of time, but um yeah, like, uh, I don't think, I haven't seen the, um, I feel like I've seen people attempt to do the mail 100,000 people credit card version of crypto, like we saw with Stellar, where like Stellar just pushed out yeah. all this money to people and people were just pushing it around. Um, but I think the thing that the credit cards really got right that I have yet to see a cryptocurrency do correctly is that they got they had to get the merchants on board, right? So like getting yeah. all the merchants, making it useful, right? Like, and credit cards actually solved the problem, right? Like you didn't want to have to carry, like you, you used to have to know how much money you're going to need when you went out to the store or to the like restaurant or grocery shopping. Um, and if you had a credit card, all of a sudden you didn't need to know exactly how much money you needed. And that's like actually a really nice thing to not have to worry about. I, I think there's more to it though, because, um, it's, it's not just that they solve the real problems. I think so do cryptocurrencies. They can, at least in principle. The thing is they solved it for a, a, solved a real problem for actual real people, like people with a well-defined sort of scope, like merchants uh, who needed to accept payments, small merchants or something. So I think that's true of everything, every kind of like um, transactional instrument going yeah. back, like uh, futures contracts yeah. solve the money problem for farmers who are waiting for a harvest that they're selling to people in another continent, dollars, gold, all of them, if you actually look, you'll find like a trusted community and you can say this money maps to this community of people who are transacting with each other. And one of the things that's been hard to do with like crypto is like, if you ask me right off, like um, who is Ethereum for or who is Bitcoin for, I wouldn't be able to draw a clean line and say, all right, this bunch of people is using this to sort of transact. It's still kind of theoretical that way. And I see some people try to solve that. Like uh, there's a startup that reached out to me. I think it's called Roll or something. Uh, but yeah, they're trying to go after like influencers or people with blogs or people with like a community. And they're trying to use that as the foundation of um, sort of transactional set. But I think um, crypto can get there, but it's so far it doesn't, it seems to me that nobody's actually solved the transactional case. And while they're trying to solve it, at the same time, the assets are inflating and they're becoming stores of value. So nobody wants to actually spend Bitcoin or anything in a serious way, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I have a, a joke along these lines. I think you'll appreciate it from Futurama. There's an episode of Futurama where Fry, yeah, so the premise, if you know Futurama, is a guy named Fry gets frozen in the year 1999 and wakes up in the year 3000, so 1000 mm -hmm. years later. And he's like a hapless character. He has like a few penny, pennies in his bank account. But in one episode, he discovers that the bank account is still alive. And he goes to check, his, check in on it to see how much money it has. And of course, because of like some small compound interest, it's worth billions now. And um, there's a joke in that episode somewhere where he has to prove his identity or something. And he says, do you accept... You know, like MasterCard or Visa. And the guy says, oh, Visa and MasterCard haven't existed for like 800 years. And he says, well, what about Discover? And he says, sorry, we don't accept Discover. <laughs> that struck me as really hilarious. Anyway, but do you know the answer to that? Like why is Discover always the butt of jokes and the they're like the least accepted? 
I don't know. No, I don't think this book is going to cover it exactly. I mean, the discover name has not even made an appearance in the first two chapters, which were about like the the situation that was existing before. Yeah, I don't know. And there's Diners Club. Like, uh, I think when I was growing up in India, we didn't have Mastercard or Visa in India, but we had something called Diners Club. But I think that's a charge card. It's not quite. A credit yeah, card. It talks about that. And like, it, I think this maps back to what you were saying about how, um, you know, like the farmer, you needed like the body of people that had the use case that they could then like map the like having, you know, the um, futures contracts for. These early charge cards were T&E, which is travel and expenses, no travel and okay. entertainment. So like the Anders Card Club, uh, I don't know if it fell into this, but it started in New York City with like specifically on like restaurants and kind of aiming for the business traveler segment because those are people who needed the ability to use money outside huh. of wherever their bank was like that, that kind of makes sense like i never actually thought about the word diners but it's literally a diners card it's like yeah uh, it, it's closer to like a subway punch 10 and get a uh, 11th sandwich free kind of card than it is like a credit card huh in some yeah. ways okay yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, but that was, that was the whole thing. Um, okay, so um, when can we expect to see the book? How much, how far along are you? Never, it's never happening. I don't know. I'm, I'm slowly working on it. It's like, yeah, we're not point, going to let you off the hook here. <laughs> at this point, it's literally just like how many man hours have I, have I sat down and actually worked on it? And it's like not a lot in the last month. So at that rate, it'll probably be sometime next year. <laughs> Well, it's not a book and you can turn it into a video or maybe write a currency or actually make a wallet and sell the wallet. That might be fun. Yeah, make a, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, there's um, some friends of ours um, do that. Like you met them, right? Joe Kelly and his team in Austin. Uh, mm -hmm. They do, what's it called? Unchained Capital. So they have yeah. their own uh, multi-sig wallet. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank God. It's always a pleasure. And I look forward to our next episode, which is C. We'll have new things yep. to show and tell. Next Do you week. want to tease the C episode? Like what you're going to talk about? So yeah. score well, clops. We'll, that's going to be the next episode. We'll better see on time next time. <laughs> we left okay. two clocks. <laughs> All right. All right. Next time. Bye, Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.